Thank you very much, Paul, for being with us today. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. All right. Just saying, um, the last time I was in a room like this, it was my honours class, and I was facing three hours of stats talking about mixed models, random effects, and <laughs> interclass correlations, and covariance structures. So I'm very, very pleased to be talking about something much more interesting than um, those topics. Um, you'll notice I'm completely inappropriately attired for Sydney. I came up with 26 degrees in Adelaide yesterday. I came across, and here I am. <laughs> People lose a cold, cold for two days, but um, yeah. We, but uh, usually you expect to be quite warm in Sydney, but uh, yeah, so I'm feeling your pain, so unfortunately. <laughs> All right, so my, my talk um, is really a bit of a summary. I haven't got um, much longitudinal data to present yet because we're going to be doing some of that work um, later in the year. Um, but I have got quite a good summary of um, some of the variables which we're going to be using for the longitudinal research. What, so this is a presentation based upon a report that's already been made public um, on the Popple's study website which is looking at the, the baseline data, talking about the characteristics of kinship carers. And I think this is something we've been able to do um, in considerable detail using the Popple's data. Uh, and I thought sort of, you sort of feel straight away while I was doing this work that, um, yeah, it's very glad to have worked with this data set, uh, not some of the others I've been involved with, because it does contain uh, many variables I would like to have measured. So, start with the acknowledgement. And just a bit of discussion of kinship care. Uh, to set the uh, topic in cons, um, sort of in, into a sort of context, I always like to sort of ask the sort of so what question. Why is it important to look at kinship care? Uh, what do we know about kinship care from other uh, national and international research? Then I'll talk about some of the analyses we've done. Uh, there won't be anything about intercross correlations, um, but there'll be some simple sort of basic analyses of what we've done. And just a few sort of, um, sort of conclusions, implications, and future directions for uh, the research. So, it's a particular focus of this um, initial report, uh, as I said, we'll be followed up with one probably coming out next year, um, is to really look at the background of children and young people coming into kinship care versus other types of care. And to look focus particularly upon um, the range of outcome measures we've got in the Pockle study, which includes you know, physical health, uh, social emotive cognitive learning, um, and also the nature of um, the kinship placements themselves. So how do they compare with um, foster carers? So that's a very important topic. Um, how do kinship carers um, deal with the experience of being carers compared to foster carers? Now, kinship care um, is a topic I hadn't even considered back when I, mean, I started doing this research back in the late 1990s. Um, we pre everything we pretty much did was um, about foster care. In fact, you were, you, if you ever um, read anything I wrote, wrote back in the late um, 1990s, it was really saying things like we've moved away from residential care, everything's about foster care. Um, kinship care was occurring back then, but it never to the same extent that it is now. And so there's been a, a, a dramatic shift towards kin, uh, kinship care in the, in the outcome care systems. And we can see that in the figures uh, plotted over time. So at the moment, um, look at the national AIHW figures. Um, I've got it's a slightly older one, but it's very similar now. It's, it's about 50% of um, children are now in kinship or relative care as opposed to only about 40 or so percent in foster care. And of course, the percentage in, relative, in um, residential care remains very, very low. So the system itself is heavily reliant upon kinship carers, um, those relatives who go out of their way to look after children and their families. The system would not would, would collapse if it didn't have those additional um, carers. And so maintaining the well-being of kinship carers is a, is a, fundam a fundamental policy and practice uh, importance. Um, although, and as you'll see in the middle of that sort of uh, four paragraph, one of the sort of key issues uh, we try to grapple with in this research is that if we see different outcomes in kinship care, is this due to the characteristics of the, foster, of the kinship carers, um, or is it due to differences in the children who are placed into kinship care, or is it a bit of a combination of those two? So one of the things, we, one of the key research questions in this area, uh, which is certainly addressed by a longitudinal study once you, you do those types of analyses, is to look at what, as I said uh, in the talk yesterday, selection versus exposure effects. Is it the case that different types of children go into kinship care? And have different trajectories and outcomes, or is it that the exposure to kinship care itself has a different experience for children, which leads to different outcomes, or are those two related? 
Now, so national and international finance, what do we know about um, kinship care? Well, well, there's literature out there, a major theme you'll see, which talks about the vulnerability of kinship carers relative to foster carers. Um, international research and some national research um, does tend to talk about kinship carers being statistically more likely to be older, single, lower SES, and more financially vulnerable. <coughs> because they're people who have essentially suddenly been put in a situation where they've got to provide care. They're not people who sat back and said, right, uh, I'm looking to... I like the idea of um, taking additional children to my home or um, my children have left home, I've got a big house, maybe I've got the ability to be a foster carer. These are people who suddenly it's often had them thrust upon them. They've got to suddenly um, respond and help their family. And they're not always prepared, as we know, for, for that uh, contingency. Now, the international research is um, difficult to apply to Australia because if you, if you read a lot of the American literature, um, much of it is about African-American people. So if you're sort of looking at sort of, you know, European and other cultures here in Australia and saying, well, how do, how do they do in, in Kinship Care internationally? You look at America, it's much, a lot of it's about African-American people who obviously have different demographic characteristics, um, cultural characteristics necessarily than the average person over here in Australia. And a high proportion of the people over there tend to be grandparents. So much of the literature talks about grandparent carers because the whole literature um, across uh, outside the out home care our home care area, which talks about grandparent carers. Um, we know we've got grandparents who do provide a lot of care in many families, not necessarily um, these vulnerable families. And that, that's, that's literature in its own right. But we don't see much about the other relatives who obviously are providing care. Um, and because many of the carers are, of course, older and more disadvantaged, they often tend to have poor health or more health needs, which is an additional burden. Uh, or risk factor for them trying to provide care for an additional group of children who may well have been um, associated, um, you know, experienced hardship or abuse. Uh, they don't have the same training or preparation necessarily to take on the role of carers. And there's always an issue about how prepared are they for dealing with complex behaviours and needs. Um, whereas foster carers may well undertake the task of foster care with, with the assumption that there are going to be some challenges. Literature also talks a lot about um, services and supports for um, foster care. Once again, this, this national literature is not always that useful for informing what, we want, what, what, what might be happening in, here in New South Wales, and that much of the international debate is about the formalisation of kinship care. That is, in many parts of the world, there are relatives who provide care, and they're not really recognised as formally as carers. They're, they're not always paid anything or paid very much, uh, and they don't seem to have the same... They're not, on the same status uh, as the foster carers. And whereas over here, um, we've got many kinship carers, of course, who are paid carers. They're actually not that dissimilar to the, the foster carers in that sense. They're statutory carers. We have others, of course, who don't fall into that category. But uh, there is a sort of a, a nominal entitlement to services and support, which uh, often you don't see in some of the international studies. And so that, that's an issue which certainly um, comes up. And I guess the other issue, if you see at the bottom there at that point, is that the um, issue with kinship care, of course, is it, it's a formalisation of a biological relationship. You're essentially, you're, you might have your grandchildren who are your grandchildren you do things with, play with, and suddenly you become the carer. Suddenly your role is, is, is different. It's more prescribed by um, legislation and your role as a statutory carer. And of course that whole role um, is quite complex for, for kinship carers. Relationships. Um, there's also studies looking at a nature of relationships. One of the things, of course, we um, are very, we, we look at, as Elizabeth, Elizabeth said, um, we, we look at um, the out home care system in terms of how well it maintains um, contact with birth families. Because with Aboriginal children, that's essential. We, 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 that's part of our mandate to maintain appropriate connections and appropriate cultural connections. But for all children, um, we don't want to see uh, where it's sensible a drop off in. in contact between children and their families. We know from the wards leaving care study that children, particularly teenagers, often want to re-establish relationships when they're, with their families when they're older. And we know that the loss of contact can make reunification much more difficult. So the, uh, the evidence um, in relation to family contact is fairly mixed from the international literature. Some studies say, well, being in kinship care makes it easier to keep in touch with your families. Others say it's more complex or it's less of it. 
the general consistent finding is that being in kinship care um, or relative care, you're less likely to go home. That's because some systems seem to treat um, placement with relatives as being a bit like a, being with family anyway, and so there's not such of an impetus to, say, send them back to, the, to their biological parents. And so we, we know that kinship care reunification rates are much flatter um, across most studies. So the first, um, I think most, most of you are familiar with the Pockle study. I think it's, it, you know, it's a study of over 1,200 children coming into care on their, their final orders. Uh, they're tracked over, they're going to be tracked for about seven years with um, about 18 months between the, the five waves. We've got, um, the data I'm reporting here comes from the interviews with the carers, <coughs> but we do have um, interviews with teachers, uh, case workers, and of course extensive data linkage and use of the Ministry of Data as well. So um, the principal um, wave one analysis we did looked at the following things. It really focused upon the, the characteristics of the kinship carers, particularly looking for the, the evidence of, of vulnerability if, if it does exist, and then the characteristics of children placed in, into care. Uh, many people working in practice will probably say or have a, a sort of gut feeling that I think the children who go into kinship care are probably different from those who go into foster care. But what's, what's the uh, Pockle studies show? And then the nature of relationships, we looked at that in, in, in some depth as well. There are other things as well I looked at in the first report, but I'll focus upon those three just to keep this talk uh, in a manageable uh, length. So some of the variables we looked at, um, won't read all these out, but um, you can see we, it's a complex range of demographic variables we were able to look at in the study. Um, the aboriginal status variable, I think, is, is quite high quality in, in the Pockwell study and it's one which we've, we've had to update. So one of the challenges with um, um, demographics is that you'll often find that um, not all aboriginal children be identified when you first, they first come into care and over time you then learn about the relatives and relationships which then enable you to uh, find out who they are. And so one of, the, one of the strengths, I guess, of doing this type of work is we have actually been able to identify quite a few more children uh, as being Aboriginal than that was the case at, uh, initially. So, so we know a lot about the demographics of the, uh, of the carers. Uh, we, we could probably argue that we could, we could learn a little bit more about the demographics of the, uh, the birth parents. We are, we are looking at a, a new wave of data collections. That's probably something we could look at in a bit more detail, but we certainly have some information about the families. Uh, we've got standardised measures. Uh, many, of the, many of the measures in Pockles are standardised. They're, they're mapped to the longitudinal study of children, so you can actually compare the results with other major studies. So we've picked up things like, for example, parent, parent experience, uh, how well the carers are able to deal with complex behaviours, their parenting style, how warm uh, or hostile is their, their parenting towards the children. And even such things as the neighbourhood quality. We often don't think about that. When you're a child, though, you often think, well, the house isn't very nice. Um, I always think when I was a child, I always didn't like houses that smelled bad or where well, there's no park or where you didn't feel very safe. You know, a sense of geography. I think there's a role for sort of geographical studies here. So we've got some stuff on the quality of amenities, um, social connections. And of course, Alain um, and Judy have done lots of work looking at services which, uh, and their accessibility in the study too. You want to feel safe uh, if you're going to go out and play. So, um, so some of the characteristics of children we looked at, um, we've got the demographics of course, we've got um, a lot of standardised measures uh, of, of children's outcomes and, and I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the child behaviour checklist because it's one of the best standardised measures which we included in, in the study. Get a sense of what their behaviour is like, uh, whether they're showing any signs of depression or anxiety. And then some of the relationship variables we looked at. So that's the general quality of the relationship between all different parties in the care system. And then the nature and frequency of contact with um, family members. As I said, if, if kinship care is associated with slower reunification, one of the immediate hypotheses in the literature, of course, is that, well, maybe they're losing contact with their families. Maybe the relatives are keeping them from the family because they know what bad stuff went down in that family. Maybe that's the reason why it's slower. We can test that idea. 
And one of the things we're able to do, which I think it hasn't been done all that often, is we're able to differentiate between different types of care, um, kinship carers. Um, most others, I think uh, there's a study by Zinn, I think, and then maybe one other, I think, in Fred Wilkson's team over there in Chicago who've looked at this, but um, often it's not been possible because the sample size are too small. So we've been able to differentiate between grandparent carers and other relatives, well, aunties and uncles typically who provide care. Uh, there's not much difference in their gender, um, their cultural background, but as you can see, as you expect, grandparents typically are older, um, as you expect. Um, but the important thing is that the, you can see that the other relatives, the aunties and uncles, are more likely to be Aboriginal carers. And so grandparents, are, um, the demographics of grandparents um, in terms of how many what proportion of Aboriginal carers you've got is very similar to foster carers. There's an immediate sort of difference which you, you note. Not much difference in marital status. Um, education levels tend to be higher in foster care. You can see that 17% of uh, foster care have a university degree. And as we expect, the, um, but the, you can see the other relatives are pretty similar in age, they're slightly younger than the foster carers. And grandparents, as you expect, have more experience of raising their own children. Um, the employment status, um, reasonably similar, but as, as you expect, as many people are retired, the grandparents are less likely to be work, working, and so not necessarily to have a secure um, paid form of employment. So one of the questions we asked in the study was about the, vulner the financial vulnerability of the different types of carers, and what you can see um, quite clearly, um, looking at the figures at the bottom there, for example, the financial position, the foster carers are much more financially secure than the other two groups. So the other, other groups argue that you know, if, if they had to raise $2,000 in an emergency, um, they would really struggle. So you can imagine what happened if they had like a funeral or something you know, pretty major happened in their life. It's pretty major, difficult uh, for these people. And both, both these groups are relatively similar. <clears throat> so you could probably argue that kinship care and foster care Oh, the two kinship care groups are fairly similar. You can talk about them as a group in relation to their sort of financial status. Household structure, on the other hand, grandparents typically have fewer people in the house, um, but the relative carers are much more likely to report that their home wasn't suitable for extra children. So the, so the grandparents, in terms of, often had quite good sized houses that kids have left quite often. We did some analysis looking at empty nesters versus those who still had children in the house. So it's the relative carers who are a little bit vulnerable for not uh, having enough you know, rooms to take on extra children. The foster carers had much bigger houses. They made a decision to become a foster carer, they got extra rooms to do it. And the other relatives appear to have much more precarious housing arrangements. And this is, this is sort of like you know, a sort of cohort effect. The, you know, the earlier you're born, the more lucky you are to be in secure housing. And anyone who's sort of younger knows the price of housing is just going like that. I wouldn't want to be buying a house now. Um, I bought a house in 2000, I wouldn't want to be buying it now. It, it, it's the cost of housing has gone up so much. So the other relatives, um, being a little bit younger, than the, and the, the grandparents, they're 48% are renting, 40% um, are mortgaging still. Uh, there's not um, very, very few unoccupiers in that group. So, that, so in housing stability, they're different from the, the grandparents. Health status, nothing too surprising here. You only merely find that, uh, as we expect, that older people, grandparents, are more likely to report health conditions than the other groups. So nothing sort of too um, surprising emerged. Most of the, um, the carers report being um, healthy. The figures have sort of jumped around a little bit there, but the top one is, is the yes. Now we administered the, um, the K10, the standardised Kessler measure of uh, psychological distress. Uh, it's used all, all across all the public health surveys. And what you can see is that the, the relative, both relative groups are more stressed out generally than the foster carers. So, for, so confirming using a standardised measure, what many of you would know from practice, that people who are kinship carers, they find it harder um, than, the, than the foster carers. So you can see there, for example, 
um, what's that, about nine percent of the grandparents of high distress or very high distress. That's, that's much higher you get in the general population. This would be regarded as quite a you know stress quite a stress group. It's, it's like twenty five percent in the other relative group. Neighbourhood variables. Uh, foster carers consistently um, gave better ratings for their neighbourhoods, and so the foster carers report that their neighbours get along a bit better. People can be trusted. It's a good place to raise children. So we've got some geographical variables which are picking up some differences between the types of placement too. So um, um, for those of you who are doing any geographical studies, some of the data I think in Popples could be used here yeah, to inform some of um, that sort of work. We looked at some parenting variables. I'll just go for a bit of a summary here rather than going through all the tables. But um, we looked at um, the grandparents are much more likely to tell, um, to be to have a warm relationship with the um, the grandparent with, with the grandchildren, which is sort of what you sort of expect of being a biological relationship. They're much more likely to say you know, the child makes them feel happy, they feel close to the child. Um, other relatives were less likely to report being getting close to the child compared with the other groups. In other words, the evidence sort of pointed towards the other relatives uh, finding the relationships a bit more strained. So it was like your nephews and nieces rather than your grandparent, your grandchildren. So the subject duties done some very good work looking at the configurations of relationships using the sort of felt measure, and that may show some some of the sort of stuff in more detail. There may be some even some issues to do with you know the gender of the child and the side of the family looking at too. Uh, but in general, grandparents, as you might expect, had a warmer uh, relationship with their um, with their grand grandchildren than the other relatives did. So there's another area where the two groups are not quite the same. Dealing with complex behaviour, um, generally the, the grandparents uh, rate themselves as more confident in being able to deal with complex behaviour. Now this might be, as I explained in a minute, due to the fact that children with grandparents might be a little different. So whether this reflects a genuine and greater capacity to do it, I'm not sure. But of course, it'll be the case that you're able to discipline your own biological grandparents a bit easier than it is to do strangers' children, possibly too. That might be the case. So the children are different placement types, so not, not much in the way of gender differences, very similar. Um, but you can see Aboriginal children are much more likely to be in with other relatives and with foster care. Less likely to be with grandparents. There's an immediate difference. Not much difference in terms of the other cult, um, the culturally linguistically diverse groups. Children in foster care are a little bit younger too, so the babies probably might, might be more likely to go into to foster care. So, child, so, how will children compare across the different groups? Well, we looked at um, the the CBC or the Child Behaviour Checklist, so looking at age three to five, what you can see straight away, this, this is the percentage of clinical cases. Straight away you see that grandparents appear to have children with far fewer problems. In fact, it's, it's lower than the, the typical norms in the population, which is about 15%. The other relatives are getting the most complex, stressed and anxious kids. Uh, when you look at the um, slightly similar in the age 6 to 11, not quite so striking, but grandparents still falling a bit below the other groups. And you can see, I've actually got externalising there too, haven't I? So, um, so both, both dimensions of the CBCL, both the behavioural and the, the psychological distress, are lower in the, the grandparent group. So for want of a better word, they seem to be getting the, the, the easier kids, can I use that sort of term, uh, the kids who have fewer problems. Um, maybe that's a, a decision based upon which um, workers are making uh, at the outset that you place with grandparents and children who seem, for whom they'll be able to cope with, or whom they'll be able to cope with. I'm not sure. Uh, there's some research being done I think, in Australia looking at decision making uh, like, in relation to placement. Might be some interesting, might be interesting thesis topic uh, or project someone could do looking at decision making for kinship versus foster care, which might uh, pick up some of this. And similar findings for age 12, 17, not quite so strong. But certainly would still be significant. And you can see this is what the national figures look like. Around about 
of children in a general population will score in the clinical range for these types of measures. Okay, so that, going back, you can see it's much higher uh, in our home care populations. What we've been finding longitudinally is, is the figures have been getting slightly better over time, although not so much for the Aboriginal children. They, their, their figures have stayed about stable, whereas the non-Aboriginal children has actually been a decrease in, in the percentage uh, of clinical cases. And that's, that's one of the things we're picking up as an area of potential uh, practice or policy focus. Cognitive functioning, we've got some standardised measures um, of vocabulary, cognitive reasoning, fairly sort of basic, um, although PVBT is fairly standard. Um, children as a whole score sort of in a slightly, in, in a lower average range, but um, the slight tendency towards the children in with grandparents to have better scores than the other groups. This is very consistent with the sort of NAPLAN results, which uh, I think, uh, which Michelle presented the other, uh, at ACWA last week, that children in now they care, they're scoring not too badly, but just slightly uh, below the population norm. Relationships. Um, okay. I'll stop there. Yep. Um, in general, uh, grandparents reported knowing the child better, having a better relationship than the other two groups. Uh, children with grandparents might like to have good relationships with other family members as well. And in general, um, children with grandparents like to have contact with their mother and father as well as other siblings. Which is sort of what you might expect, isn't it, uh, given that it's, it's grandparents and, and, and I know the other relatives. So, summary conclusions. Uh, there are clear differences between the characteristics of different carer groups. Uh, not all kinship carers are the same. Uh, grandparents seem to be the most vulnerable group in relation to their health, financial situation uh, and, and mental health. Uh, whereas the uh, other relatives probably are more, most vulnerable in terms of their housing situation. Um, children place the grandparents in a school better on most of the um, developmental measures. So we're not quite sure whether that's due to um, easier children being placed with grandparents. Um, but what we'll be able to do with a longitudinal analysis is look at the children who are matched on characteristics, how they do uh, place in different types of care over time. Um, the evidence certainly doesn't provide any evidence that kinship care is an inferior or problematic form of care. In general, in fact, um, it's quite positive. Um, but there's quite clear evidence that there's some overlap between Aboriginal status and the type of care in which you're placed. And so any conclusions drawn about kinship care or even about Aboriginal children care, you've got to take the type of care into account in those conclusions, I think. All right, um, acknowledgements to all the people. I'm a very small player in what's been a very big project uh, over many years, but so thanks to all the other people who helped out. And of course, the details of the report on the website. Thank you. Thank you.